Welcome to the Reformacy Dispatch podcast. This was recorded on 15 March at 10 a.m. Jakarta time. Things may have changed by the time you heard this podcast. Please enjoy the show. Kevin, great to hear your voice. We've got a little bit to go through. As always, uh, there's <laughs> some interesting developments on the on the political and uh, and uh, corruption or governance front, and um, some sizable developments in economic reform that are sort of chunky bits happening frequently over time. So it's all amounting to sort of this. Um, it's all sort of coming to a head, a, a change in pace of sorts. And I was uh, hoping. Uh, we, you and I were discussing that we might actually devote most of this pod discussing that with uh, a follow-up interview for, that, that we'll broadcast next week with uh, Sri Adininsi. She is a, uh, a past economics advisor for President Choko Widodo and um, professor at um, Gajamada is, and someone that you hold in, in, in high yeah. esteem. Yeah, yeah, uh, she's uh, she's uh, quite the expert. So uh, we'll be able to uh, kind of delve into the issues uh, with her in, in more depth uh, next week, um, and, and this week we can kind of go over what's been happening lately because uh, we've discussed some of these things over the past few podcasts. But every week there's a couple of new developments, uh, including this past week. And she's uh, subscribed to the pod. She's a fan. She told me it's great. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's, let, let's start off with, uh, let's, let's sort of take care of business with, over at uh, Partai Democrat. Um, what is the latest there? It sounds like Maldoko may be falling short. Right. Yeah. So on the political front, uh, you know, the headlines are all still completely focused on the uh, Partai Democrat Omni shambles, uh, as they say in the UK, which is uh, the Omni shambles. Yeah, basically, I just heard a, that a real. Yeah, <laughs> it's a free for all. It's a full on uh, melee, um, and uh, there's a lot of tension that just uh, escalated very rapidly. So there's different viewpoints, uh, and um, last week uh, we discussed how uh, the impetus for this will inevitably create suspicions that the president is trying to seek a third term, and then all the headlines this morning are about suspicions that the president might be trying to seek a third term. So huh. uh, that happened. Do you think that, well, uh, <laughs> that and that is um, very, very worrying for a guy who, who is who campaigned originally as a as a uh, custodian of, of, of the constitution. But just to recap, Modoko is Joko Widodo's uh, chief of staff and he's vying for the chairmanship of the Partai Democrat which is the political party or the political vehicle, depending on how you want to look at it, uh, of uh, Cecilia Bambang Yudiono, uh, Joko Widodo's predecessor. This is a big, big deal that happens to go through. And now, and what would what yeah, that the, would do was give them the quorum in parliament to start talking about changing the constitution. They managed to, to get control of it. Yeah, and uh, what, what makes it all so unsavory and unseemly is uh, the way in which it's unfolding, which is uh, the um, imposition of an extraordinary party congress that happened on 5 March, which uh, was, to all observers, blatantly spurious. Uh, it was, uh, by no stretch of the imagination, a legitimate congress. And yet the president's chief of staff is very much uh, insisting that he is now the rightful chair of the largest opposition party. So it's uh, right. not very sporting, to say the least. What's interesting, though, is that um, it, this effort by Moldoko may now be unraveling, I think. How so? The next step for them is to gain formal recognition from the law ministry, headed by Yasono Lauli of PDI Perjuangan, the largest party, uh, the one to which Vidoro belongs to. So when this first happened, uh, when the Congress took place uh, on 5 March, there were uh, questions about whether the law minister is behind this uh, from the outset, in which case Moldoko will, would get recognition from the ministry right away. But right. What's happened since then is that uh, yeah, Moldoko appointed uh, Johnny Allen Marbon as the uh, supposed Secretary General of Moldoko's party. 
And his job is to compile a uh, dossier or a burkas in Basa, Indonesia, to provide to the law ministry to substantiate their claims of having won this Congress and elected Moldoko. And Marbun has yet to do that. Uh, and they claim now that they're going to do it today, uh, the 15th of March, but it's basically taken them 10 days. And that's interesting because if this thing had all been prearranged and everybody was all on board and... Uh, you know, the, the, the law ministry was in cahoots with Moldoko, mm. then Marbun would not have needed days, presumably, to put together this document for the minister's approval. It, it seems to suggest that they're really scrambling to try to make a case that uh, yeah, can substantiate their claims, which in turn implies that they feel that they have to substantiate their claims. In other words, they're not, a, they're not in a position where they're just assuming that the law minister is going to recognize them regardless of what's actually inside this dossier that they're going to hand over. So, so that's if, one thing. if they thought that Lauli was going to be in their corner, chances are they would not have be scrambling so much to explain themselves. Yeah, it's yeah, I think so. Yeah. So um, and it's uh, interesting, too, because there really are some minimum requirements you have to have in order to convene an extraordinary party congress. And now. Those are set forth in the party bylaws, which first came out in 2005, then underwent revision in 2010, and uh, most recently in 2020. You know, each set is slightly different, so the, the, the latest 2020 set is very stringent about the requirements uh, for a extraordinary Congress, and specifically the party's high assembly chaired by former President Susilo Bamangiriono has to approve the Congress. That clearly did not happen in this case. <laughs> So Marbun, therefore, is arguing that, well, no, those bylaws in 2020 are not valid because we changed those and we reverted back to the 2005 bylaws, <laughs> which don't mention a high assembly or, or uh, any any approval from Udiono. And um, so that's what he's been propounding. And he, he's a, deliberately attempting to try to sow confusion and mislead the public on this point. Um, and his critics point out that the, the Congress that supposedly revoked the 2020 bylaws and reimposed the 25, 2005 bylaws convened before it revoked the 2020 bylaws. And so therefore, it would have had to comply with the 2020 bylaws in order to convene and revoke. You know, and it, it mm. hadn't. Uh, so his argument is uh, it's got a, a logical flaw right there. And I think that's something that's difficult for them to overcome as they're trying to put together these materials to substantiate their claim. What has Jokowi said so far, yeah. if anything? Any comments from the palace? Uh, well, okay, so yeah, multiple presidential spokespersons, uh, there, there's a few that have that role nowadays, uh, are all quite, quite strenuously and adamantly denying that he has any designs for a third term. So that's, that's encouraging to hear, but it, it would be better to hear from the president himself, but maybe he feels that he... Uh, should not stoop to this level. Um, so right. it's, it's all very awkward for him because it's his personal chief of staff who started this whole fracas uh, in, the, in the outset. Uh, but the, meanwhile, though, there's, there was another comment last week from uh, Pratikno, the uh, state secretary, and that's the one that I think holds water um, because he's uh, quite different from a lot of the other members of Widodo's inner circle. He's uh, an accomplished academic. He had been rector of Gajamada University, which is uh, you know, within the top three schools in the country, if not the top school. Jokowi's alma mater. Yeah, Jokowi's, yeah, you know, Widodo's from there. Um, and Pratikno has been with Widodo since uh, early 2014, since before Widodo took office as president. And um, He's very careful in how he chooses his words. He's not one to uh, speak too freely or loosely. Uh, he's not flippant, uh, and nor will he uh, simply spin the truth. Uh, and what he said in early February, when the Udiono family first raised concerns about maneuvers to oust them from their party, was that this is an internal party matter. And therefore, the president is not going to respond to the concerns from the Udiono family about Moldoko's apparent uh, implication in these efforts to oust uh, the family from their party. So that was in early February. Now, fast forward, and sure enough, uh, it was mm -hmm. not an internal party matter, and Moldoko was very much involved. And in fact, he came out as the supposed uh, elected chair. And 
So a few days after that 5 March uh, extraordinary Congress, Pratik now issued another statement to Kompas, the, the leading Indonesian language daily newspaper, saying that, quote unquote, neither I nor the president were aware of this Congress, end quote. So basically hmm. denying that they had anticipated or, or were informed or made aware that this thing was going to happen. And that's actually credible because uh, right up until that Friday afternoon, the press was unclear about whether Modolko was actually going to go to this uh, Congress in Delhi, Serdang, North Sumatra or not. He was in his office throughout the first half of that day. Uh, and then only at the very last minute did he board a plane, go straight there and attend the Congress and receive election. So it's kind of credible from Pratikno that um, the president was actually not aware of Muldoko's uh, shenanigans and, and, and scheme. Uh, in which case, then that's a little bit reassuring because it, it suggests that this is not some uh, elaborate grand design to end democracy. You know, rather, it's just the adventurism of a sole operator. Right. What kind of confidence can Jokowi have in Modoko if this, well, if this falls through and really plays fast and loose with some pretty important democratic institutions? Yeah, it's, it strains credulity. Um, what yes. confidence the president can have in him and, and why the president uh, continues to tolerate him. Uh, there's a lot of costs associated with uh, keeping Modoko in his role right now as chief of staff. Um, you know, the, the flip side of that coin could be, this, this is just speculation, maybe Muldoko was already aware a couple of months ago that he's due to leave office. Maybe there's already been some arrangement behind closed doors that uh, he will shift out of his role. And therefore, right. maybe this whole ploy to get this party is a way to secure his future, uh, which now appears to be failing because you know, the, the Congress was uh, just didn't have enough people <laughs> And much less uh, legitimate people in attendance. The bylaws, regardless of which version, all say that you need to have two thirds of the provincial chapters attending and uh, half of the district chapters attending an extraordinary Congress. And so that, that comes out to uh, a little over 300 people. And if you look at the pictures of the actual Congress in North Sumatra, I don't think they had 300 people in the room. Mm. So even if every single person they had in the room was 100% legitimate, which is far from the case, um, they still wouldn't have met yeah. the requirements, even in the 2005 bylaws, much less the uh, 2020 bylaws, which are actually the ones that they should be uh, accountable to. Can I ask a stupid question? I mean, I've done it before, so I guess I'll do it again. <laughs> um, you know, it's a fairly, um, it's, it's a perceived knowledge that um, SBY may have had a hand in Ahok's undoing. Uh, he may have been involved. Mm, just kind yeah. of possible payback or a warning? Oh, um, no, I don't think so, no, because, um, yeah, uh, I hope just doesn't have that many friends. <laughs> um, and that, yeah, but uh, that move, that that uh, could have fatally wounded Jokowi's political prospects. That was That was the most dangerous point of his presidency. And yeah. uh, SPY had a role in that. And I just sort of wondered if, um, if he was going to fiddle with his presidency. Jokowi might turn a blind eye to fiddling with his uh, political vehicle. Right. Yeah. 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 A dynamic of Indonesian politics is that so much of it is operated by just a handful of elites, many of whom have been around for decades and their personal pasts are so deeply intertwined that it's really hard to keep straight of uh, you know, who hates who at the moment uh, mm. because uh, there is a lot of bad blood between uh, Iriono's Parte Democrat on one hand and Megawati's PDIP, which includes Widodo on the other hand. And a lot of that stems back to 2004 when Iriono faulted Megawati's husband at the time, now deceased, uh, Tofi Kemas, I forgot about for that. having insulted him. He yeah, has a pretense for uh, resigning from his post as coordinated security minister at the last possible minute to register his party for the upcoming election and then doing well and then continuing in the presidential election and then ousting Megawati in 2004, later in 2004. So uh, there's no love lost. <laughs> very much alive in Megawati's mind. Yeah. And we don't right. know. Uh, 
perfectly kind of keen to align with her. So for him to uh, yeah, uh, be in this mess right now is awkward. Mm. Uh, six months from now, what's Modoko's future? Will he be Tarawand? Sent off on a to, to a, on an ambassador ship someplace far away, but pleasant. Yes, yes, I think uh, you can. I could definitely picture Moldoco in Rome or Buenos Aires or uh, mm. well, <laughs> even. <yeah. laughs> right. Okay. Now, what is the Secretary of the Supreme Court, and how did he manage to build a bunker with um, fast cars and exotic motorcycles? Yeah, Nurhadi's motorcycle bunker. This was uh, one of the sensational stories of 2020, uh, just a year ago, but it actually goes back to 2016. Um, so as at the time, as Secretary of the Supreme Court, Nurhadi was the top civil servant in the court. So not a judge, and not a member of the judiciary per se, but uh, the head of all the uh, bureaucrats or civil servants uh, in the Supreme Court and the judicial branch. Uh, doing the uh, behind the scenes administration of of the work there, and that was uh, a post that had enormous power. Uh, in particular, he he was able to do things such as determine which justices handle which cases. Ah, okay. uh, and it would appear that he yeah leveraged that role uh, in order to be a power broker and determine outcomes in certain cases. And uh, one in particular at the time was uh, huge in terms of monetary value. A uh, arbitration court in Singapore had awarded Malaysia's Astro 250 million U.S. dollars in damages from Indonesia's Lipo Group over their dispute over a JV in direct vision pay TV service. So Lipo disputed that international arbitration outcome in the Indonesian Supreme Court and lost. uh, and, but then rather than uh, pay the damages to Astro, Lipo appealed that through what's called a, a case review, PK. And uh, there some uh, bribes allegedly occurred involving Norhadi and uh, Eddie Sindoro, who uh, has a long association with the Lipo group and had already served a corruption sentence in the past uh, for, uh, for wrongdoing associated with the group and uh, went back to jail a second time uh, for corruption involving uh, Lipo-related cases. However, when the KPK, the Anti-Corruption Commission, investigated Nurhadi and raided his house, there were uh, uh, a number, I think uh, six or eight, active police personnel guarding the residents, and they prohibited entry to the KPK for quite some time, which was really not supposed to happen. They set up, like, barriers? Yeah. (laughs) Uh, well, that was the, the, no, this time they didn't, it wasn't barricading. They just, um, there was a standoff for a little while. The barricades came later in a different location. <laughs> this is a long oh, story. It, this was like, <laughs> this was like, a, a, this was a Tom and Jerry skit going from villa to villa, <laughs> yeah. right? They, they chased him around, yeah. right? It was, he has like a dozen, a dozen villas yeah. or apartments. Yeah, right? there were 13 residences. Yeah. So this was just the first of the 13. Um, and, uh, when they finally got in, his wife was putting documents down the plumbing in the bathroom, uh, that related to the Lipo case. And, um, huh. uh, Nurhadi's wife was a senior civil servant. That's, uh, uh, Ken Zubaida. The problem here was that, uh, the only witnesses to this uh, scene, uh, were these police personnel and none of them would ever testify in court uh, against Nurhadi, uh, which was a bad sign. Uh, so therefore, uh, the KPK failed to catch Nurhadi um, in that instance. Now, a couple of years later, um, Widodo approved the appointment of a active three-star police general to chair the KPK uh, starting in December 2019. Yeah. So, in the KPK's or in the in the final weeks of the old KPK roster, they. Um, uh, unveiled three different corruption cases against Nurhadi with very clear-cut, difficult-to-dispute facts and handed that off to the next KPK under this police general. And at the same time, Nurhadi went missing and nobody could find him. And so the uh, KPK investigator Novel Baswedan, a cousin of the Jakarta governor, mm-hmm. uh, who 
is a renowned investigator, and he discovered a villa owned by Nurhadi in Megamendum, Bogor. That's where the uh, the staff erected barricades to prevent uh, entry to the KPK investigators, and it took them uh, a while. They finally had to scale a uh, a five meter high fence uh, to to get in. And then once in this uh, villa a compound in, the, in these uh, hills, they, they discovered a, an underground bunker with uh, three luxury vehicles and uh, 13 high-end motorcycles, you know, Harley Davidsons and racing bikes and so on. It's like something out of Iraq. So yeah. for the, the, the Saddam Hussein. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, it's, and Nobel Bas Whedon should be, a, a, we should uh, remind the listeners, Nobel Bas Whedon suffered a terrible acid attack. And um, this must have been when he got, got back from treatment in, in Singapore and took, and, and took up his duties. And he's mostly blind. Yeah, so that happened in between time. So, so after that raid on Nurhadi's home, uh, a year later, uh, uh, Baswedan was you know, visiting his neighborhood mosque at 5 a.m. in the dark and walking home. And two people on a motorcycle threw acid in his face and... Um, destroyed one eye and, and badly damaged the other. So he can just barely see now. Uh, and then after that, he, after multiple surgeries, uh, he returned to duty and, and then pursued Nurhadi um, to this villa. Uh, where they found this evidence, which the KPK seized, all these motorcycles. Uh, and then three months later, finally, uh, Baswedan's team was following uh, Ten Zubaida, uh, Nurhadi's spouse, and she was delivering messages or, or something to him at a, a residence in Simpruk, which was a neighborhood just right off Jalan Sudirman, downtown Jakarta. And uh, they arrested him there along with uh, Nurhadi's son-in-law, who was also a suspect in these particular graft cases involving a, a port company, uh, some some small port company. It's only, it's a 49 billion rupiah graft case. So it's, you know, that the three of them together amount to that much. It's not, not a, an earth shattering sum, but the Circumstances were very clear cut, so it was a, a fairly straightforward one for the KPK to prosecute, and so that's what happened this week. Um, to finally to bring us to the punchline after all that, uh, so the justices gave, or the judges rather gave Norhadi a six-year sentence, which is uh, half of what the KPK had been seeking. Plus, the judges uh, demanded no restitution of uh, money uh, from the graft cases, uh, arguing wait, that wait. this money don't have to pay it back from the state. Yeah, I don't need to pay it back because they said that it didn't come from the state anyway. So, uh, so the KPK is appealing, so it's, it will continue. But um, that's where things stand now. And is he in custody, or is he on his? Yeah. Is he out um, on appeal, pending appeal? No, he's. Uh, yeah, he, the KPK uh, keeps people in custody uh, throughout. So he is, um, and uh, he has to serve at least six years unless he wins a case reduction. Uh, later, which is probably not likely. So this is all pretty significant, though, because, uh, you know, first of all, it reveals a lot about what was going on in the Supreme Court. Um, it um, also is kind of a test of uh, the judiciary uh, these days in terms of the, the resolve to mete out justice for uh, defendants like this. Uh, and... Um, it's, uh, it also puts into perspective the uh, dynamics in the police right now with the, the new chief appointed by Widodo recently who uh, is uh, pledging to institute reforms. Okay, let's leave it there. And when we get back, we're going to talk all about economic policy reforms. And we're back, Kevin. Um, there has been this steady drumbeat of economic reforms that sort of points to a renewed confidence um, for the remainder of the Widodo presidency. And we've had the omnibus bill. Uh, we've had the sovereign wealth fund for for what it's worth. We've had um, some reforms on taxes that we we, we talked about uh, a pot or so ago. Um, Walk us through how you think that this is significant um, and may, maybe you sort of sort of couch it in a way because we've had periods of big economic reform. I'm thinking after uh, the Asian crisis, uh, the banking reform, and Joko, we actually came to office promising to streamline bureaucracy and to make Indonesia more competitive. 
How does this period fit in that context of big economic reform that we've seen in the past, just in the past 20 years? Yeah, I would say it's right up there. Um, in fact, there's a, an old adage that uh, I learned in college, uh, which um, is uh, arguably still true today for Indonesia, which is that uh, bad times make good policy. That was a refrain often heard because throughout the 32 years of Suharto, there were economic ups and downs caused mostly by international changes, you know, the price of oil in the 1970s and uh, the uh, sovereign debt crisis in the 1980s and um, uh, commodity price fluctuations. And so Suharto, apart from everything else, was at least uh, determined to produce strong annual GDP growth of about 7%. And so when that was in jeopardy, he was willing to turn to his economic technocrats and allow a certain measure of reform to stimulate the economy. And that happened periodically uh, throughout that uh, those three decades. Uh, when times were bad, then there was reforms to uh, help growth resume. And then uh, that was the case also in 98 with a, a host of reforms that happened amid the Asian financial crisis that caused a 13% collapse in GDP for that year. Uh, and then in the Megawati era, there was uh, a lot of support from the IMF and uh, the finance minister at the time was Buriono, and uh, he was eager to uh, bring about reforms. So there were uh, some important uh, restructurings and uh, changes in subsidies and liberalizations of regulations and also a few privatizations of state-owned enterprises. Uh, then there was another bout in um, the Uriono era, but uh, you know there the reforms were definitely not as deep. Uh, the Consensus didn't exist, and then especially by the second Udiono era, uh, there was a, a real uh, sense of nationalism uh, arising. What did happen is that the military was taken out of business, and that was important because before that, there was a huge conflict of interest there. But it really wasn't until 2014 and the election of Widodo that a couple of big reforms happened again, uh, and that was again because of necessity. Udiono at the time in uh, late 2014 handed off a government to the newly inducted Joko Widodo in October 2014 that did not have enough money to get through the year. So uh, as Udiono was uh, going out the door, you know, Widodo came in and suddenly had to find a way to pay for the government for the final two months of the year because the fuel subsidies uh, for petrol were so high that uh, there was a hole in the, in the budget for that year. And so therefore there was a, uh, a fuel subsidy reform enacted right away by Widodo, which was uh, quite constructive. And then Widodo also pushed through land acquisition reforms that um, uh, insiders in the Udiono administration had stymied for years. So that kind of puts things in context. Um, since those two big reforms of Widodo back then uh, on, on energy and land, uh, there's not been a lot else uh, since really uh, until this push for the omnibus, which uh, started in 2019, finally came to fruition late last year and uh, now is uh, enacted. And now that that omnibus uh, law on job creation is uh, initiating a, a host of implementing regulations to to uh, carry it out. And these are the things that are really bringing about quite a lot of change and uh, generating uh, some interesting momentum. And at a really good time, too, because it was from about 2014 um, that the Chinese were embarking on their, their Belt Road initiative. So there was a Although the resource money started ebbing, there was some infrastructure funds coming along. So there was that, that dovetailed nicely with the reforms in um, land acquisitions, for for example. Yeah, yeah. So that's been the, the story of the, the first Widodo administration was a boom in infrastructure development, which of course has uh, uh, positive uh, economic multiplier effects. And of course, and, uh, yeah. The, the drag on all this are local governments. Um, and But I think even there, there's been some reforms of how they have to uh, spend their money or wasn't there, hasn't there been some, some bureaucratic reform there too? I mean, there, there, there's the problem with Indonesia is that you can reform all you like at the top. What happens down at the local government level is it can be 
another matter. Has has there been improvement along those lines too? Right. Yeah. It kind of depends on the sector and the region. Um, so there's a, uh, there's been a real high level push for a lot of the infrastructure work. Uh, and uh, yes, there was a reform in the first Bidota administration to repeal power over land acquisition from local heads and vested instead in basically the National Land Agency and also the Finance Ministry. So centralizing control over land acquisition was a, a, a big feature of the reforms in 2015 that uh, really propelled a lot of the infrastructure progress uh, that's happened to date. Uh, meanwhile, there's been these direct elections for regional heads uh, since 2005, and that's gradually been producing a few better ones here and there, some of which are enthusiastic supporters of investment. Um, so, uh, and then now the omnibus uh, job creation law revises permitting processes. And so that, that was uh, important because lots of times uh, activities on the ground are held up by a very local level uh, permitting restriction, which is really just a shakedown for graft in, in, in some cases, at least in a lot of cases. And there's a, a real, uh, pretty thorough rearrangement of permitting processes as a result of the omnibus law. And uh, so that's one of the reforms that remains to be tested in practice. And one of the big uh, upcoming junctures, uh, which uh, really was announced uh, this, this past week by Balia Lahadalia, head of the Investment Coordinated Agency, is that the uh, online single submission system will happen in June. So this online single submission system is uh, used to be called the uh, one-stop service. Uh, yeah, one-stop yeah, yeah. One, one roof, uh, you know, sort of uh, investment processing system. And it's something that Budiono had uh, sought uh, 15 years ago. And there's been promises made over and over again. And it's just been so complex with so many stakeholders and so many vested interests that uh, it never really gained enough headway. Uh, but the uh, omnibus law provides a legal basis for actually enforcing it. And with these all these other reforms that have happened over the past uh, two or three months especially, there's clearly quite a lot of uh, consensus within the Widodo cabinet for pushing these kind of things through. And, and that's what really matters is right. top -down support from the ministry level. So it's, it's kind of encouraging and, pros and, and promising. But we can't really talk about economics or the or the, the condition of, of the economy or policy without discussing state-owned enterprises. They comprise <laughs> such a so, – right? I mean, they comprise such a massive part of the economy. I think the revenues are about 11% of the GDP. And I, I, uh, I've, I wrote a little bit on this. It's the most extensive uh, state-owned enterprise network outside of China. There is even – there, there's even a state-owned enterprise for for pawn shops. Yeah. Um, so, so there's rice, of course, and there's sugar, and there's a air, there's an airline, uh, you know, the railways. You would expect those post office, that sort of thing. But also pawn shops and uh, other thing, uh, other businesses. Any and and that real, you know, no, the uh, Indonesia is entitled to organize its its economy any way. It, likes but the drawback is that it crowds out private investment and the one example is uh, online payments you know the the, the go pay the the ovos of the world um one would think that the government wouldn't need to step in to help correct a market failure there or to retain some sort of strategic control because i mean those companies are indonesian anyway uh and yet the state-owned banks have their own online payment system, like Linkaja, just purposely going after private investment to take part of the the pie for itself, which I sort of think is egregious. But you know, Eric Torhier has told me that that's just the way it is, and uh, <laughs> state-owned enterprises are, are never going to go away. Deal with it. So um, <laughs> no, he didn't say he didn't say it like that. But you know, he said this is this is the way things go here, and this is an, an important, and we all think it's important. So, you know, that's the way it is. Um, do you see any sort of softening of those attitudes? Any, well, maybe a diminishment of the skepticism that tends to face private yeah. investment. I'm not. I I'm, that's yeah. not overstating it, right? It is sort of skepticism, especially 
if it's foreign investment. Right. Yeah. Things are changing noticeably for the first time in a decade. Yes. Uh, so this is problematic in part because uh, it's enshrined in the Constitution. Uh, there's a, a, a big role for the state to be played because of Article 33 and, and other articles as well. The Constitution calls for an economy organized on the family principle without specifying whether that's a functional family or a dysfunctional family. Hmm. And then there's also the, the history of animosity between groups um, and um, sectarian uh, sentiment because the colonial administration deliberately divided the economy along racial lines with business interest uh, concentrated among ethnic Chinese and uh, uh, non-commercial functions segregated with the so-called pribumi population of uh, non-ethnic Chinese Indonesians. And so that's a legacy that has burdened Indonesia in that state enterprises, as you mentioned, are prolific. And there, the problem is that you've got a, a dual role for the state of being both the regulator and the operator. And uh, that's just uh, inherently problematic, inherently full of conflicts of interests. <clears throat> it brings about a situation where the state enterprises have uh, political influence in their running. And then vice, and conversely, policymaking is affected by the uh, interests of the state uh, in terms of economics and, and the operating of state enterprises. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it makes for a, a very messy system. And then uh, the, the nationalist sentiment has been, has been very strident at times in the past, um, you know, especially uh, five to 10 years ago. Uh, there were two IPOs in 2011 of Krakatoa Steel and Garuda, neither of which went well. And since then, there's been very little um, state enterprise IPO activity, much less any outright privatizations whereby the state sells down majority control of a particular state enterprise. In fact, the word privatization has hardly ever arisen in a high-level public discourse over the past decade until last week, when <laughs> suddenly it was all over the place. Uh, hmm. because, uh, it was Tohir himself, actually, who called for privatizations, using that word, privatizasi, of certain state enterprises. Now, specifically, he was calling for selling off those that have revenues under 50 billion rupiah, which is small. That's, uh, you know, total sales of less than 4 million US dollars. So it doesn't really mean a lot, but it, it, it's, a, it's a step. That's a, that's, a, that's a bonafide baby step. That is a baby step. Yeah. Privatization is not something, I mean, it was trying to, it was something I was trying to get a Pak Eric to say during our interview. And I don't think he, he did. And he is famously a, a businessman himself and was really trying to get him to, to express his frustration with me. But of course he, he wouldn't, but I kind of wonder if he is working a little bit of um, some free market charm within cabinet. Yeah, uh, he must be. I think uh, there's several ministers who are doing that, uh, somewhat against expectations, uh, actually. Uh, Erlanga Hartarto is coordinating the economics minister. He's presiding over all this. Uh, Luat Panjayatan was uh, one of the several ministers who have been pushing for the omnibus law. And then uh, Eric Tohir. Of course, there's the finance minister, Sri Mulyani Indrawati. Uh, and um, now there's uh, the, uh, the new industry minister, Agus Gumiwang Kartasasmita. And he's been pretty proactive in trying to uh, arrange for some big ticket investment deals involving Honda, and they're in talks with Tesla still as well. Uh, and then you've also got uh, Balil Lahadalia, who seems quite ill-equipped for his role as investment coordinator and agency head he, because of a language barrier. Uh, he addressed the Jakarta Foreign Correspondence Club this past week uh, in Indonesian, which uh, makes things tricky for a lot of uh, foreign correspondents. Uh, but you know, he's delivering. He, he brought about this uh, positive investment list, um, which... Uh, you know, deregulates foreign ownership ceilings, as we talked about before, uh, which has never happened before. So you now this this cabinet team is delivering, but what they're doing is uh, focusing on the, the deregulation of obstacles to investment, but still with a top-down approach where they're, they, they have, uh, they're trying to bring about economic outcomes through policy manipulation, especially with regard to example, yeah. electric battery manufacturing and uh, downstream processing of nickel uh, and these types of objectives. Uh, but, you know, at least it's something, you know, there's still the problem of uh, the institutional 
fundamentals uh, in the legal system and in the civil service uh, to support uh, you know, impartial regulation. But um, yeah, the, these uh, these these reforms that have come out are are, are helping matters, and it's. So here I was talking about privatization of these small state enterprises and also the president uh, brought up uh, the, the issue as well by revising the uh, privatization committee, uh, which had not been revised. The membership had not been revised since 2014. So that's sort of uh, in, in and of itself says something as well. So it seems as if they are preparing to try to uh, raise some money from sales and stakes of state enterprises and maybe even in some cases uh, outright privatizations. There's um, a little bit of a ticking clock here, or just a, there's there's a bit of pressure. I mean, for, well, first of all, the reform is great, but it needs to be judged on the basis, on the relative basis of how other like economies are going. So, if Indonesia is is reforming at an all right pace, and Thailand or Malaysia going at a at a cracking pace, mm -hmm. um, or Vietnam for the Vietnam has been eating Indonesia's lunch, then despite all of its efforts, Indonesia starts cre creeping back down the league tables that we, uh, Jokowi is so um, enamored with, and the ease of doing business, for example. And I think that there's been some backsliding there. Uh, there's also, and we need to bear in mind, that there is sort of a window of opportunity in surprising a way investment that is starting to trickle out of China um, after the problems with uh, COVID and the, the, the trade row, the um, lower value textile manufacturers, the, elect the electronics manufacturers um, are seeking a, a cheaper, safer place to do business that is free of the political rancor that can come with uh, doing with uh, manufacturing in China, at least you know, diversifying uh, mm -hmm. away from China. And Indonesia wants to get a piece of that pie and Vietnam seems to be beating them to the punch. So what, what, what's your sense and how they're tracking versus the regional neighbors? I don't know if you're really a, across Vietnamese politics, but um, that that is sort of the barometer that we need to sort of judge their performance by, right? Yeah, 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 and it's uh, it's apparent uh, the echoes of what's happening in Vietnam are, are uh, manifesting themselves in Indonesia. For example, uh, officials, including uh, Laha Dalia, talk about how the government will facilitate investors and uh, find them the land and inputs and connections that they need to bring an investment to fruition. He emphasizes the Batang Industrial Park in central Java as a place that's available for investors to come in and, and use with everything they need right there. Uh, and that's kind of reminiscent of, I think, uh, how investors uh, uh, enter into Vietnam and the reception they get from the, the government there. Uh, the difference, of course, uh, one of them uh, on the plus side, in Indonesia, you have uh, uh, a pretty good democracy, and that's that should be reassuring for a lot of investors. Of course, I guess there's a lot who maybe don't appreciate that or uh, uh, don't uh, kind of think through the, the linkages for the long term about the benefits of a dem democratic system in terms of removing periodic succession crises when when rulers uh, come of age. Yeah, a la Myanmar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the, in Vietnam as well, you know, how what, what sort of uh, succession plan is there in Vietnam? You know, that's, a, that's a pertinent question for a lot of investors, I think. So that's on the yeah. plus side for Indonesia. But then on the negative side, you've got the governance issues, uh, the, the legal system certainty. And so that's where this new police chief that the president put in uh, holds some promise. Uh, and uh, the education system. So that's a big difference because uh, workers in a lot of these other countries uh, have uh, better skill sets than um, uh, most Indonesian workers. What's your, what's your thoughts on Pak Balil? I mean, I um, three times, I've, <laughs> I've applied for uh, interviews with him. They've all been set, only to be uh, canceled on short notice. Three times. Oh. I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter. I'm fine. <laughs> um, where, where, you know, it's fine. I'm fine with it. Uh, I'm glad to see he's talked to the JFCC. Um, but you know, his predecessors, say for example, Tom Lembong or uh, Ch uh, Kathy Basri, 
you know, at the conferences, you could sort of sidle up to him and ask him some questions. He might background you. He might even answer your uh, what's up messages. But you can be sure to get to be pointed in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, these are some pretty high caliber. I think they both went to Harvard, I think. Is, is there a real risk of a fellow that can't really talk in broad brushstrokes about the about investment policy, economic policy. I mean, he can't speak English. So is that a problem? Yeah, it's a it's a shortcoming. It's a weakness. It is a problem in interfacing with the international investors and uh, communicating clearly with them and addressing uh, their concerns and questions, which can be extremely complex for sure. Yeah, but on the other hand, he has strengths that maybe some of his predecessors did not have, which uh, for one thing, is a very can-do attitude that that comes across very forcefully with uh, uh, mm -hmm. Um and uh, he uh, he clearly has uh, sway and, and an ability to work his network of connections throughout the government, and that counts for something. So, you know, on that okay. side of the equation, he I think he appears to be making progress there. And, and so far he's uh, delivering pretty well. Um, you know, the, the investment so, numbers for foreign investment <laughs> last year were pretty good, all things considered. You're saying he has better things to do than talk with reporters all day. Okay. That's fine. I, that's, I'm fine with yeah. that. <laughs> I can't imagine what, but anyway, <laughs> Kevin, thanks for this is a great way to start my week. Um, and I look forward to our talk with uh, Bu Sri Adininsi. Um, tell us a little about her, what to expect. Well, yeah, an experienced, uh, accomplished uh, economist who's uh, got a perspective uh, into a lot of the uh, higher level uh, policymaking and privy to plenty of information about the, the trends that have been unfolding and um, the uh, impetus for a lot of these uh, reforms. And then also, um, I'm curious to hear her uh, views on their uh, consequences uh, for the economy, uh, looking at the next uh, uh, year or two, the remainder of the Widodo administration. And a woman, our first woman on the pod. Yeah. Finally, a woman. Kevin, yeah. talk to you later. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Bye now. And that's the program. Our editor and producer is Stephen Handoko. Music by Blue Dot Sessions. For a free trial of Kevin's Reformasi Weekly Intelligence Briefing, visit reformasi.info. As always, you can contact us on Instagram at onthelevel underscore media. And if you like this podcast, please subscribe and rate us. It helps. This podcast is a production of On The Level Media. I'm Jeff Hutton. Bye for now.